She is one of UK's highly regarded entrepreneurs and social philanthropists. She has appeared on many TV programs, best known for her appearances on Channel 4 TV series The Secret Millionaire and as a judge on the BBC's The Apprentice, You're Fired. She owns and runs multiple businesses and has created a multi-million pound portfolio through her investments. Today, I'm in Derby and I'll be having a conversation with Kavita Ogoroy, OBE. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you very much, Kavita, for um, accepting the invitation for being on Pathway to Grow. Um, and in fact, thank you also for hosting this because we're actually in your offices here in Derby. It's a wonderful experience. Thank you very much. I'm going to go straight into it. Um, we're going to begin with the beginning in mind. Now, I've seen one of your previous interviews and you've spoken, in fact, not just in the interview, you've generally spoken very candidly about some of the challenges that you faced at the beginning. Uh, coming from um, a, a, a traditional Asian family background, being a woman, um, and, and some of the uh, adversities, if you like, or uh, the obstacles that you had to face to get to where you are today. Can you share a little bit more about that with us? Yeah, um, well, um, I suppose my entrepreneurship, um, that really comes from my father. So he came to the UK in the, early, in the 1960s and he um, started a business. Um, he was very, very, very clever, never did anything with his hands. It was all with his brain. He watched somebody plumb a bath and he uh, asked his brother to come over to do the handiwork. But that business is now third generation. Yeah. So, um, but in our family, it was men went to work and women's role is in the home. And from a young age, I was always, you know, challenging that status quo. So I was one of four children, had an older sister, an older brother and a younger brother. And the path for me, the supposed path was I'd have an, an arranged marriage and be at home um, looking after a family. Um, but, you know, as I said, for me, you know, I always wanted to do things um, that broke the norm um, and uh, my mother really is the one I owe who gave me my emp the empowerment to go out and fulfill my dreams. So um, in terms of my business lessons they sort of started quite early. Mm -hmm. I've got really good memories of going out with my father at the age of two to his business meetings. In those days children wow. used to get left sometimes in cars and as well as, <laughs> as, as parents yeah. used to go in. Yeah. You'd never do that now but I do have those um, and, and actually I know everything about plumbing because um, I used to go into the shop and uh, sell copper pipes and 15 wow. mil elbows etc. So I got wow. some very good sales experience um, and my unfortunately Unfortunately, my father passed away when I was 15. Sorry to hear. Um, and that was the time of just sort of doing my GCSEs. Um, it, was, it was a really, really difficult time. And I, I decided I was just finishing. I'd, I'd go and get myself um, a job. I'd go and get myself a Saturday job or something. Um, and um, I, I've always been into sales. I like fashion. Mm -hmm. And some of you may remember Richard Shops. I managed to get my job, first sat job, Saturday job with Richard Shops. And that was just after my father passed away. Um, and my mum just got a big barrage of, you know, what is going on? Has my mother had a breakdown? I'm bringing shame to the family because my father had built um, wealth, etc. What was I doing going out to work? A this reputation along with absolutely. that. You know, there's a reputation within the community as well. Exactly. You know, I, I, I was bringing shame on the family. And um, my mother just sort of said to me, you know, sh she would support me um, and for me not to bring 
shame on the family and let her down, which meant still pursuing what I wanted to do, but following the tradition of having an arranged marriage and everything else that comes within the Asian tradition. So we, we had a pact and I think because of that, you know, I did go on and I did go and get a, a university education. I was the first female in our family circle to do that. You know, uh, I, was, I was a trailblazer. And then after that, that became the norm. You know, mm -hmm. before it was frowned upon, the norm before that was uh, very little education, arranged marriage. Um, but, you know, that sort of changed things. And I think there comes a time when things change. And I think, you know, um, Hopefully, you know, you can see that you can do things within the realm of culture and tradition, but there's no reason why you can't follow a successful career path. Excellent. Well, that's a very inspirational uh, story there, right there in itself. You know, a lot of people will be thinking, uh, I suppose, with doing so, um, when you started your journey into entrepreneurship, um, you wanted to become a doctor, right? So you, you, you wanted to follow the path of uh, doing medicine and... Yeah, so yeah, I, I really wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. Um, and when I did my A-levels, that's the path I wanted to do, but that wasn't allowed. The reason being, that would take um, about six years of education. I'd be too old for anybody to get married. <laughs> yeah, you know? 22 or 23, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, that ceiling, yeah. if you go past that. Yeah. Um, so um, I opted to do applied chemistry instead. I wasn't allowed to go away from home. Yeah. I had to make some compromises, mm. so I think, but in life, if you want to really do things, you have to compromise, you have to make those Absolutely. compromises. So I used to travel from home every day to university. Mm. So I did applied chemistry, which, um, and I did a, a research year during that year. I worked for ICI, um, and there was a few things that that taught me. Once, whilst I was doing the research year, I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't me going to be in the labs. I needed to go and follow that my passion of you know medicine and all the things I was passionate about. So I thought, you know, after I finished, what job could I do that could get me in front of doctors? I wanted to be a doctor, and I was very good at sales, and I wanted a company car. Okay. So those three things. <laughs> yeah. So um, I looked up medical sales, and mm. I managed to get myself. I got myself a first class honors degree. Wow. Um, very quickly got um, a, a role with um, Bayer Pharmaceuticals yeah. um, and my mum was absolutely panicking like hell because I still wasn't married you know so <laughs> it was it was a difficult time because probably from the age of 16 I was introduced to numerous partners from the age of 16 right up until uh, you know I finally did say yes <laughs> Wow. But I had to sort of stave that off until I knew I'd done my A levels, I'd yeah. done my degree, and yeah. then I just got my job as well. Excellent. Yeah. From the age of 16, 16. imagine that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so uh, if we just cast, cast our mind back to how culture has changed, um, I, I still remember the days when, you know, girls used to get married at such a, a young age, and now, you know, so much has changed. Fantastic. Yeah, because my sister got married at 19. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of my sisters did yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, 17 as well, yeah. in fact. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So tell us a little bit more about how that transition was made from being an employee into getting into self-employment. OK, so I think, um, you know, things happen along the way that sometimes push you into going into entrepreneurship. Um, and I suppose for me, um, you know, I was always very ambitious. Um, I was a, one of the top performing medical sales reps and I decided um, well actually it wasn't myself and it's quite important that you do have mentors and people perhaps who push and guide you and somebody suggested that I should apply for a promotion because it was a job that had come out so um, that's what I did um, I like everything I'd already set up my vision I was going to get this this is what I was going to do um, and unfortunately well fortunately actually I didn't get the role um, I didn't even go for my feedback, which I should have done, you know, I, 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 you know, and I think um, in corporate culture, sometimes your face fits or it doesn't, but I, I just decided, you know, for me, maybe I needed to do something else. And I did start going for interviews to join other companies. Okay. And I can remember coming out of those interviews thinking, you know, do I really want to go and work for another company for, I'd done it for eight years, for somebody to then make the, the decisions that I'm not good enough because they hadn't even given me a chance. Yeah. And that's when I thought I'm never, ever going to work for anybody again myself. Mm. 
So um, I was working in the pharmaceutical industry at the time and um, the industry provides you with very good training, negotiation skills, sales, etc. And I thought about my skill base and I was selling a um, drug for cholesterol lowering, statin. Statins okay. were all the rage at the time. Mm. And we had some clinical guidelines that had come out and those guidelines said that we must treat patients who have had a heart attack with a statin to prevent a further heart attacks. So um, I used to go to see my doctors and I talked to them about the guidelines and I'd say this is what you need to do, uh, will you put them on a statin? And then I'd go back two, three weeks later. And I'd say, doctor, we talked about this and nothing's changed. And I got really frustrated and I thought there must be something I can do to help the implementation of the guidelines. That mm -hmm. will help patients. It would mean it would help doctors. Um, so and ov obviously if it would support the growth of statins as mm -hmm. well. Um, so um, I realized that what the doctors needed to do was to know who are the patients, who are the patients she would treat. They needed it very simple and a systematic process in place. So I self-taught myself all the clinical systems, all the GP systems. And this was again, breaking all the rules. The doctors would allow me to go onto their computers and I would go, <laughs> here doctor, here's your list. Yeah. And then I'd go back and they'd, they'd treat, the patients were treated. Yeah. Um, and to cut a long story short, I managed to get myself in front front of the world's biggest uh, pharmaceutical company Pfizer wow. and they had the world's biggest brand Lipitor and that's the world's biggest brand yeah. and I talked about um, my vision and what my company could do what my company could do to support um, the brand strategy yeah. and growth yeah. and that would be a service that would help to um, one um, help patients because that we prevent them from dying it would help doctors and doc no, they were just as I set up just before the government had reduced uh, uh, they'd put out there a new incentive scheme which meant if you got patients to a certain target of cholesterol they got paid okay so there was a bonus for uh, doctors to get their cholesterol as low as possible Lipitor was the world's best brand to achieve this lowest target so therefore when they're looking at these patients some of them may have been suitable for Lipitor mm. um, and they bought into my passion um, and there it was you know I can remember walking out uh, with a half a million pound uh, contract and I was thinking oh my god I need to put uh, people in place you know I was working in my bedroom I, yeah. uh, I don't know how I managed to get away with it at the point because it you know you normally have to go through a procurement process yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the time there was only me but yeah. I had had portrayed this vision of you know yeah. the company could go and do this yeah. and they said right we want you to go and your company to go and deliver this was in june by december yeah. 800 practice audits wow so it all started from there wow now that's a big figure in terms of what you'd won as a contract and and a lot of responsibility falling on your shoulders you mentioned um having been have, uh, uh, having mentors and coaches that, that being important did you yourself have a mentor or a coach and do you still have one now? Well, I suppose, I suppose my mentor was my father, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, that that's my figure I looked up to. Mm. But at the time, you know, no, and, and I don't think, you know, I set up in 2001, mm. there wasn't access availability and you just learn as you go along. Yeah. So gosh, you know, I had to learn and it's very good actually, I had to learn every element of the business. Mm. And I think every business owner should know that, you know, you should, should you should, Obviously, as you grow, you need to delegate, mm. but it's very, very important. You know every aspect of the business and, yeah. I, and are able to do it. Yeah. So in the early days, I was doing the audits myself, so I know exactly what that involves. Mm. I used to have an answering machine on, uh, you know, even have, I, I remember that answering machine used to come home, listen to the messages, wouldn't have the Blackberries and iPhones at the yeah. time. Then, you know, I used to do all the paperwork and the processing of all the stuff that yeah. used to come through. Um, and you know, 
the pharmaceutical industry was a, it's a very very compliant industry mm. but they were very good in terms of we worked um, well I worked with them to help develop the contractual process how we were going to do the contracting the practices you know and there was a lot and I actually to start with I put some freelance people in place who then tried to, to steal my business parts of my business wow. and I went through all you know all the time that's it in business you learn yeah. and you go through difficulties and challenges yeah. but then you're smarter the next time around yeah. so you know it, it was it was an exciting exciting but a very tough time and yeah. then you know I, I decided that if I was really going to grow I had to start employing then you start the, down the employment route so that's how okay so a lot of people watching this um, whether it be single fathers mothers or parents in general will be thinking to themselves um, as a parent these things can be very challenging to start up a business did you have a family then did you have children then and how, how did you how did you manage that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, well, I was married. I had already had one daughter. I, had, I was expecting my second daughter when I went for the interview. Wow. Um, for the for the promotion, I was on maternity yeah. leave. I never got it. Went back for six months, and then obviously I left and set up the business. Um, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law died when we got married. So my father-in-law has been living with us all that time. So I had the responsibility of all the house and setting up this business. And my daughter um, was probably less than six months old. So how did you manage all that? What, what's your secret? I mean, how did you get to work on the business and look after the family and get that right balance? What, what advice and tips could you give to people out there who are probably in a similar situation, if not close to, uh, as to what you did and maybe what they can possibly implement to get that right balance? Well, it all depends, you know, what is it that you want to do? For me, it was very important as a, for myself to be able to work. All I've ever wanted to do is to go out to work. I don't want to be stuck at home. So if that meant getting up early in the morning, making the roti so they're ready for the <laughs> evening, then you, I would do yeah. that. Um, so I would try and schedule my work around the duties I needed to do at home. And having the food on the table was very important. My mother always said to me, give me one piece of advice. You can do whatever you want make sure that roti is on the table right she said then you'll have a peaceful life so um and then obviously uh you know technology allows you to work you know you don't have to work the fixed hours so what i would do make sure i've done everything and then i'd start again after i've done all the family stuff so mm. i'd be working through the night sometimes mm -hmm. laptop emails etc yeah. but you just do what you need to do mm. and even now you know i do what i need to do my father-in-law is still living with us been married now 25 years and he wow. still expects that his dinner is on the table no matter yeah. what i'm doing or where i am oh, brilliant fantastic and and throughout that time your business has grown it's flourished um from the beginning stages, you went from hiring associates to hiring employees. Now you have so many employees. Um, what, would, what were the challenges that you faced throughout the growth period? Um, or what were the key things that you learned through the growth period, which you feel people should be mindful of or maybe conscious of when, when they're considering growth for themselves? Okay, so I think if you really want to grow, you have got to have um, investment, okay? So that that could mean not just investment of cash, but you've got to invest in people and the resources, okay, to help grow your business because it is about a team effort. You know, yes, you need to be skilled in so many areas of your business, but, you know, as you are growing, if you bring in people who are have got other skills that complement you, that can help your growth, and that does take investment. Um, I was always very 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 lucky in that and I don't think you really benchmark yourself as a business person mm -hmm. but built up some significant cash profits etc and really you know never needed lending or anything like that but then there came a point where I really wanted to significantly grow build a, a big commercial property portfolio uh, set up the Oberoi business hub which is about supporting businesses and serviced offices virtual all the back office support um, and then you know we we started accessing funding um, and I suppose you know it probably would have been good to start thinking about that growth earlier 
earlier in that journey. Mm. I think there's a fear as well. A lot of people think, well, I'm just too small to do that. I think there's also a fear of letting go a part of your business to people who are going to be working for you. Because as, as, an, as an employer or as a business owner, you always tend to feel that you know best or you have the, 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 the genuine um, drive and passion that may not be shared by your employees. Well, the thing is, I always used to say, when I used to interview somebody within the first 30 minutes, I'd know if they're going to share my vision. Mm. Very, very important that people you take on are absolutely behind you. But, you know, I've had people who've like come on board. I've had to fire people because actually they were trying to do things behind my back that mm. would impact the business. Mm. Um, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're not a natural leader you're mm. a control freak and mm. you want to do everything yourself and you learn the hard way so i've had to develop myself as a leader and somebody who delegates and even now i don't think i'm, I'm the best person i am still a control freak well that's what entrepreneurs are um but then you know you have to just sort of let go um and try and tr you have to bring that trust in um and you know you've got all the HR challenges that come with all of that. I mean, at one point I bought and sold into a company and we had 700 staff. Wow. Um, so you imagine all the sort so of security company. Yes, right yeah. So I was um, a co owner. Um, I'd, 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 I'd helped fund um, a company that, you know, had some difficulties mm. and we turned it around. And then I um, exited from that company um, and again I think it's all good learning it's mm. all you know it's a really good learning and you learn lots of things mm. which makes you better for the next time doesn't mean yeah. those challenges don't come mm. it, it just makes you a bit more astute yeah you mentioned um, firing people it just came to my mind that you were uh, one of the uh, pa panel judges for um, The Apprentice yes. you're fired yes Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, well, I've done that previously. You, you've been on several TV programs, haven't you? Yes. Like the, the Secret Millionaire, The Apprentice, um, ITV's, uh, what was it called? Business Club. Business Club, yeah. Richard and Judy, different things. Sky do, as yeah. Well, yeah. So obviously when there's lots of business things going on, you know, I get approached. I did get approached to come on, go on Big Brother, but I said no. You know, <laughs> okay. I always do that get That would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, my children said there's no way you're going in there, and I said I'm not either. But, you know... Um, with media things are very last minute yeah but you know if it if it's to do with business mm. and i can um share some of my pearls of wisdom that helps somebody else mm -hmm. then you know then i will take part so obviously with the apprentice you're fired um you know it's a, a program i know it's you know it's a reality tv but there are still some lessons in mm -hmm. there and for me it's part of the debrief so okay. what that person was doing wrong and i'm able okay. to share that in terms right. of my business experience so Did you ever tell anybody you're fired? Um, myself. Uh, my, in the program? I don't in the program, in the so program, I'm just okay. on the debrief. Well, I'm on the judging panel. Can we make up for that? If you look in that camera there, <laughs> right, and look, point in that camera with yeah. a serious face yeah. and say, Brad, you're fired. Brad, you're fired. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so that's on record now, guys. So, you know, we can we can keep that. Um, and we'll pass that over to Brad when we, when we next see him. Um, Apart from the business side, you also get involved with a lot of charity work. How did that come about? Okay, so my charity work, so I think it was back in, back in probably 2000, right, so my father was an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. okay, but he was really, he was a philanthropist. And he's passed away now and nobody ever remembers him for his business success. It's for everything that he did wow. for people. I still get people saying, you know, when the video recorder came out, your father bought it for our family and bought it and they remember that. Or, you know, we had a dishwasher broken and he didn't. And my mum used to complain that people used to come to our house for dinner. <laughs> they not only have the dinner, they'd go away with the shopping and we'd have no yeah. food left. Yeah. So he's a very, very generous man. So I sp and I think all those things, you know, ha have an influence. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got my job at um, Richard Shops, I used to do a hundred pound standing order to Oxfam every month. Okay. You know, so it was, I suppose, early, early on, yeah. I, I was sort of doing that sort of um, charity. And then um, I, uh, when I set up my business, I was approached to do the secret millionaire. 
And at that time, the first time they approached me, I said no, because I was interested in making money. I wasn't mm. interested in giving it away. Yeah. So I think you've got to be passionate about something. And then I went on to a, a women's delegation in Mumbai. So it was a, a, a trade mission. It was with a group of women, and we went over to Mumbai. Um, and I met a lady there who'd gone over to India 35 years ago and she'd set up the National uh, Spastic Society. The reason she went, she had a disabled daughter, um, she went over and she wanted to change the fact that disabled children would get the right to education because there was no rights in India. It took her 35 years and she changed that right and her own daughter got a double MA in Oxford even though she had cystic fibrosis. Yeah. So there's no barriers to achievement the barrier is within ourselves and I met her and I thought oh my god how amazing look what this woman has done I really need to do something more that's out of business yeah. so I suppose she inspired me and I thought you know wish I'd done the program because that might have helped me to get into some charity work mm -hmm. and I remember then on the plane coming back thinking oh you know I should have done that and then a week later they approached me again and this time I said I'm absolutely going to do it because yeah. good because I was passionate about it I never yeah. do something I'm not passionate about and then I ended up doing the program and I actually ended up up giving to charities one women women's empowerment because yeah. it, you know I know if girls are empowered from a young age they will go and achieve their potential and it was a charity who was working with young girls from the age of 16 to 22 um, who'd been in difficult situations mentoring them and doing things to help build their confidence that really fit in with me and I gave monies to a doctor's practice wow. um, and again they were setting up um, uh, a centre for asylum seekers etc and it's all to do with health etc um, and then that got me into um, we actually, I became part of that charity. We expanded the programs into Derby and we got some awards from our council. Um, but then I got approached by the Global Girls Fund, which is a global charity, which is part of the Girl Guides movement. Yeah. And they were having their centenary year. And they wanted me to chair the fundraising of 10 million pounds to um, empower women globally. Um, and I, th I took that on. Um, and again, I was chairing that fundraising and we fundraised, our target was 10 million. And we did it in three years. Wow. Um, and then all that money went to different organisations across the world all to do with women empowerment. And, and you're heavily still involved in, 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 as a philanthropist, you know, you do a lot of work continuing to do so. So I'm sure it's very much appreciated out there. Yeah, I mean, I must talk about my latest project. My latest project is making sure every child in Derby goes to school fed. Brilliant. I sit on the council and about five years ago I heard that we've got children in our city who are still going to school hungry. So it's taken five years but we're there now and we've got the college, the local college this year that helping us to fundraise £50,000. Fantastic. So last year uh, myself and a colleague we funded the pilot for a mm. number of schools and this year it's going to get bigger and hopefully we'll get it citywide. Fantastic, brilliant. Well we're behind you with that. Brilliant. Excellent. You know, a lot has changed since you first started business. And um, I remember uh, coming across one of your quotes where you said, success in life isn't based on your ability to simply change. It's based on your ability to change faster than your competition, customers and business. Brilliant. You know, it's, it's, it kind of hits the nail on the head. And I couldn't help thinking about how much has changed since you and I and, and some of us had actually started in business and, you know, the changes that we've gone through. I mean, look at, you know, things like this, doing live videos, for example, uh, and how much that's had an impact on uh, personal branding and getting businesses out there. How do you manage change and, and what is it that you look for before you embrace change? Well, I think in a business, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're constantly thinking, you get up in the middle of the night and you think, oh, we're going to do this now, we're going to do this. Or you think about something that you've read um, and, you and you know, you, you've, you've got different things happening in the environment and how you're going to adapt. Mm. And, and it is about, you know, your suppliers or your supply chain. It's constantly wanting more for less or, you know, it's about adding value. For me, you know, you've got to add value to whatever you're doing. So, um, 
I think it's natural part of entrepreneurship, but also, you know, you have to pull back as well, because if you're not focused enough, then you're not going to really achieve the amount of growth that you want to do. But change is inevitable and you do have to, you have to be looking and, and it's brilliant that social media does allow you to track competitors, the market, what's happening out there. So for example, at the moment, just today, there was something out there um, about MMR vaccine uptakes have dropped again in Birmingham. Mm. Mm. I'm thinking, gosh, Oberoi Consulting, we were commissioned by um, the primary care trust in London some years ago, mm. about six or seven years ago, to increase the uptake uh, because measles is coming back. And you think, mm. gosh, and then obviously social media allows you to communicate some of the work you did very quickly to a large audience. So, you know, you've always got to be listening, looking about what's happening so you can adapt or make the most of opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, to... It, it is very different. You know, we didn't have the platforms when I set up. I don't even think I had a website for six years. <laughs> it was terrible. Wow. And even though, you know, in terms of our websites, we, we update them because they're not working on their platform, they're not responsive. So it's constant. Yeah, and constant it's very change. important as a business that you have a personal brand as well. People yeah. buy from people. Yeah. Uh, and that's quite a new phenomenon, I, I think. You know, in the last few years, I've noticed more and more business owners have focused and pushed on their personal branding. For example, uh, KavitaAbroy.com, MajidWaris.com, you know, SafraZali.com. You know, everyone's focusing on that because mm. the, the idea now seems to be that the, the social media or the digital media has brought the world so much closer and people have direct uh, contact with the people who are running businesses. 20 years ago, the, the, the efforts it would have taken for somebody to get in touch with you directly would have been phenomenal, you know? Right now, they can look at your Twitter handle and just send a tweet mentioning you, and, and that's it, you, you're there. Yes, you know? absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I know personal branding is really important because it is about people. Yeah. People buy from people, you know, you build that trust, um, and then that's how, how business starts. Which obviously has an impact on your reputation as well. When people want to know who owns this business, what's the leader like, who are they being led by? If I'm going to be even applying for a job with a company, imagine you had an opening and I was to apply, um, then I would want to know, well, the owner of this company, what's their values? Who are, what are they about? Who are they and what's their reputation like? Because it's just as, uh, 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 just as important to focus on the good things. It's also important to focus on or be conscious of at least the potential negative impact of using social media. Donald Trump, for example, oh, is gosh, it? Is yeah. it like it's a, <laughs> good, without trying to get into politics or anything, but you know, there are there are negative impacts as well, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's important, you know, as a as an employer, you know, we will look at when people apply, we will look at their social profiles. Yeah. We will look at, you know, yeah. their history um, to give us an understanding, you know, do they meet our values or what's going on? Is, the is that the type of person that we want yeah. to employ? Because, you know, people are our biggest assets. Mm. Exactly. And if they're representing your brand, then, and then it's uh, something to be very Absolutely. conscious of. Excellent. From your observations, what sets businesses apart in the big wide market? So whatever, whatever market you're in, there are lots of different types of industries and lots of different types of businesses. In from your observation, what sets you apart as a supplier? Okay, I think um, it's very important that you add value. You know, quite often, you know, we we will do work and it's taken us longer than we anticipated or what we quoted for. But we never go back and ask for more. What we do is deliver the value and the benefits and that gives us longevity and then you get more referrals and you get that continued. And for me as well, if we're ever doing some work for any company, I run it as if it's my own company. You know, you've got to be passionate about it. You've got mm -hmm. to give, you know, as if as if that's you're doing that for yourself. And I think then that comes across and you'd run it those projects like that. So I think, you know, to really partner with your clients, you have to be seen as a partner. We are never ever seen as a supplier. Mm. We are a partner. Great point. So on the consulting side, we are a partner with our clients. Um, on the business hub side, you know, I think it's amazing that 
to have been partners to so many companies and we've seen their growth. So, mm. you know, we help them just to start off with the virtual office mm. or mentor them along the way. We've been real partners in their growth. Mm. And they'll quote us. Mm. Um, those companies will talk about, you know, who impacted your growth. So it's about partnership. Excellent. You're talking about partnerships and, and being seen as a partner. Um, there's also a point of uh, f forging strategic alliances to help your, I guess, clients or, or the market out there. How important is that for a business to consider strategic alliances? Strategic alliances are very, very important. So at the moment, I, if I give you an example, on the consulting side, um, we're doing a lot of work in AF and stroke prevention. So if you have AF, which is um, a heart uh, defect, um, you have a greater risk of having a stroke. But if you have it, it can be treated, you can be anticoagulated and treated. And uh, through the work that uh, is going on in the UK and has been going on, if we screened more patients, then we would find more patients. And we've been doing a project across Leicestershire, across 150 practices. And part of that has been screening. And we now have the data to show the benefits of that screening. And we've been putting in their devices that patients can 30 second screen, straight away mobile ECG and it tells you if you've got AF. Mm. Now what what we did was we had that device but what we had to do was remind a doctor at the time the patient presented or the doctor so people don't forget because people are busy they may have just come in for flu. So we implemented a system within their system that they use that would prompt this to happen but what we want to do we need to really get this out there so we're working with some national stroke association uh, charities and societies who will then try and spread the word so that's that's an example of a strategic alliance which is very important for our business but very important in terms of getting this message out there to um, GP practices CCGs patients about the benefits of screening fantastic and again, all through strategic alliances and making sure that the, the best value is provided for the clients. You do a lot of work with startup businesses and, and help people when they're starting up new, new businesses. Um, what would be your top tips in the current climate for people to consider uh, when starting a new business? As well? um, first of all, you've got to be very, very passionate about what you do. If you're not passionate, then um, then don't do it. Um, and you've got to really understand that, that business inside out. So just don't go and copy someone. You know, you've got to have the... Mm -hmm. If you think about when I started, I had, this, I had that good grounding. I knew the NHS, I knew pharmaceutical industry. I had the good, that grounding. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to think about um, a business that solves a problem. If you okay, can yeah. do that, then you can be very successful. So think about the problems out there. Think about the businesses that came, uh, we never had, and but they were solving a problem. And look how successful they've been. So if you even think about my business, I was trying to solve that problem. Yeah. Those patients weren't being identified, so I need to provide a service to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Some of the most successful businesses are mm -hmm. those that solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important, you know, nowadays you do have ac access to um, workshop platforms such as this, yeah. learning, mentors. Mentors are really important because they can fast track your journey. You know, when I started, all of that wasn't there. It was just all self-taught. So all those things are really quite key. Um, and, and, and also then thinking about your business. And again, early on thinking about the strategic alliances and, and obviously making sure social media platforms are visible right from the start, such as a website and all of these things that surround that branding of a business. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important that branding is important, is key right at the start. Fantastic. You know, you've, you've done so much. You've achieved so much uh, in your career. And a lot of people would look at this and think to themselves, you know what, that's it, you know, they would love to be where you are now, but you're continuing to still grow and look for new opportunities. What's your driver? What motivates you? Oh, I think, you know, for me, it's, 
I think if somebody says you can't do something, that absolutely really does <laughs> okay. drive so me. So what have you just been told that you can't do? <laughs> All the time, people, you know, probably think, um, I mean, what, what I remember when I got my first class in chemistry, somebody mm. had told my parents, she's only ever going to get a B in her GCSEs, wow. you know. So, you know, if somebody tells you you can't do something, you need to use that as a lever to do it. Yeah. But I, I suppose I am very, very self-motivated, but most entrepreneurs, you know, they will diversify, mm. they will continue to invest yeah. because it's that's how the entrepreneurial mind works. Yeah. So, you know, growth is always at the top of the agenda. Um, you know, last year I, I did buy out some um, companies to support our call answering business. Mm. Um, I'd like to invest in more commercial property because a business hub has gone incredibly well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, there's a plan of action ready for this year yeah uh, I suppose um, some of the stuff that you do outside of work can also be considered motivational absolutely as well. yeah. I mean you know the charity stuff I love that and I suppose it for me it's about making a difference where can I make a difference uh, and work then isn't work even when we're doing stuff on the health side and we're helping and we're finding these patients it's like wow that's amazing yeah. because really we it's all been thought up yeah. and then when you see it happen in, in practice it's really motivating yeah. so if I go and visit a school and 60 kids are having breakfast which I did recently yeah Wow, because yeah. it was just a thought, wasn't yeah. it? And one person... And there's an emotional driver behind exactly. that. And emotions uh, are, are a, a more uh, significant driver than a logical decision, I guess, aren't they? Absolutely. So I think when you see your vision or some of your ideas fruition into practice, then that motivates you to think, gosh, I, I did that. Yeah. Wow, did I yeah. really do that? And then that <laughs> spurs you on to do more. Amazing. Now, before we did this interview, as you know, we, we uh, made some noise about it on social media to let people know that's what we're going to do and we had some people asking questions which they would like for you to answer i don't i think you might have seen some of okay, them um, fire away. but i'll fire them away anyway so we have imran shiraz on linkedin he asked the question what impact is brexit having on your business or likely to have once everything has been finalized okay so um, if i think about oberoi and the two big focuses so consulting is healthcare, mm -hmm. and the oberoi business hub is all about supporting um businesses either startups or growing businesses so on the healthcare side our key clients are pharmaceutical industry and the nhs now uh, if we think about the pharmaceutical industry brexit is not great because of the potential implications so we have the european medical authorization which sit in london in the uk mm -hmm. we have all the regulations that take place and are european wide you know how are they going to affect the approval of new medication uh, because with it being sat in europe that's a faster authorization yeah. process yeah. gets access to medicines there's a whole waft of things there that will affect our clients which then as a supply chain can affect us so we will see how that pans out so mm. yes so we're already thinking about the impact there uh, and again having to adapt and you know there's some things that we're doing in terms of research and development in terms of innovation medical devices um, some guidelines we'd follow our European how are they going to change and what do we need to do in that mm. whole regulatory process mm. so we will we'll have to see and we have to adapt there's, there's, mm. we just have to adapt on the Oberoi business hub side Brexit is, is, is in some ways, you know, is, is, is quite good because what do we allow clients to do? In an uncertain market, people don't want to get into a long lease. Mm. You know, gone are the days where somebody would take an office for five years. Mm. So we offer serviced offices. Mm. So somebody just wants something for three months, they can come in because when they come in, they don't know if they're going to downsize or grow in six months. Mm. So we've had clients who have gone from a £35 a month virtual office up to a five-person office and they've done it all through us. So that flexibility wow. Wow. really works for businesses. Yeah. We do back office call answering. We, we support over 300 businesses nationally. And again, at the time of uncertainty, people think, do I want to employ somebody? Or do I just want to outsource this activity? Somebody can answer my calls. Nobody ever knows we're not part of the business. We have access to diaries, etc. So we're just a reception. We can transfer. So again, we've had more companies think, actually, just wait. I will outsource that. Um, so I think on, on, and then we've got virtual PAs, we've got the virtual back office. And I think we've seen that really increase. And especially 
new businesses, home-based businesses. I mean, mm. January has been one of our busiest months for people taking on virtual yeah. services. Wow. So wow. one side really positive, yeah. one side not so positive. Um, we have to s wait and see the impact. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, I hope that answers the question for you, but I'm sure it does. We have another question from Tariq Chowdhury. His question is, what has been your best investment and why? Okay. And then what has been your worst investment okay. and why? My best investment has been my investment into commercial property. So okay. we're sat here. He happens to be in property development. As, uh, okay. so, yeah. so I've never done um, property um, residential. I've always done commercial and... Okay. Um, so we're sat here in Oberoi Consulting in this park. Mm -hmm. So nearly f the six now that I own on here. Wow, okay. And that so you're operating out of nine, number 19 and 20 from this. Yes. Yeah. So if you so go down the road, a uh, number of those properties, yeah. I actually own those wow. properties. Um, and they have been a brilliant investment and I need to buy more. Um, I got into commercial property in fact right at the early point of my career after three years I needed an office mm. and I went from my bedroom into number 19 wow that was scary wow. um, you know it was a massive investment we took on the bottom floor but I managed to rent the top floor so that got me into the whole commercial property yeah. and then in 2012 um, when the, the hub came along we needed more space to grow in the mm. last 18 months we've We've moved about uh, three times, but the, la the wow. property I bought 18 months ago right at the end is a three-storey. Okay. Um, and again, this is where networking is really important. I managed to n find out who the owner was because we all were, used to be on a telecon and there were uh, two brothers, Jews, in London. When I needed more space, because I saw that they were advertising the bottom half was available to let, I rang them and I said, please let me have that property. So walk mm. away from where I am. Mm. And I thought, if I buy it, I can go into the bottom floor. Mm. I convinced them, they did mm. it, sold it to me. And then my tenant said, we need the bottom floor. Okay. Oh my gosh. So then I thought, right, I need to, it's beneficial actually that they want it yeah. because this gives me an opportunity to yeah. do it again. Yeah. And then where we sat here came for sale. Yeah. So we, wow. And then there's another property, a couple of properties there, which I acquired along the way. And for me, you know, you have to think about your, your exit strategy or getting older. And I thought you know, there, you have to make money while you're sleeping. Yeah. You have to, yeah. you know, you can't always be doing that. Yeah. So that, you know, you know, is that guaranteed income that's coming yeah. in all the time. And so I really understand the commercial property market. Excellent. So that's been my best investment. Excellent. What about your worst, worst investment? My worst investment is back in 2007 or 8, I invested in uh, property uh, before um, the crash uh, in Europe. And again, you know, sometimes you get influenced by what people are doing. And I've really got to, you've got to know what you're doing and know mm. it for yourself. And it's not yeah. a market I've been in. And there was all the things, you know, when we joined the European Union, everything's going to go up, etc. At the time, the... The euro was 143, um, and then the crash happened, the mm. euro happened, and no, you know, there was, there was a time when everybody was buying mm. these properties, and I lost money on that. What would you say the lesson learned from there was? I think the lesson learned from there is, one, you've really got to understand your investment when Due you're doing it. Yeah. Due diligence. I mean, I bought and sold companies, mm. so, you know, some of the, what I know about due diligence now is far better than when I knew when I did my first one. So your due diligence is really, really important. Your contracting process is really important. All those things that, you know, you may just, because somebody else, you, you know somebody else who's doing it, they may be experienced, but you're not. Yeah. Yeah. So you you need that due diligence, you need that experience, you Brilliant. need that expertise, and then you've got to make a calculated decision. I know entrepreneurs, you know, take a lot of risks, but they've got mm. to calculated risks. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, Heather Jane Eggington on Facebook, she asked the question, what is the main thing you had to change about yourself to get to where you are today? 
not be as controlling. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, that is really difficult still because yeah. you want to do everything, you want to be part of it. And also you're a perfectionist. Everything is about, mm. you know, being a perfectionist. And compromise, you know, I do have to compromise. I, 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 I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter-in-law. Mm. Mm. And, you know, sometimes I have to compromise um, to fulfil all those duties and run a business. But then if I want to run my business, I have to make those compromises. Yeah. Yeah. When you say not be as controlling, do you mean in, in like within your workspace as well? Or, or, or I suppose so. I mean, you know, it, it, I think delegate. let things or, or let things or I don't know, um, would you say some things were just meant to be? Or are you that no, kind of absolutely not. You know, I absolutely need to know where I am at okay. any point, what we're doing. Yeah. I need updates. I need to know, you know, I can delegate out, mm. but I need to be on top of it mm. because, um, uh, but, you know, you, you, you do have to, you have to watch your business. Mm. You know, if I went off and did media all day, my business would suffer. So, yeah. you, you know, you, yeah. you have to be, your business, get, the balance, is, get yeah. that balance there all the time. But I think, you know, I have learned to be, I suppose, a better leader in terms of delegation. Um, you know, people want development. You have to understand people, what makes them motivated. It's not always about money. So I think I've had to learn all of mm. that because I wasn't, when I took on, when went from employee to entrepreneur, mm. I was never in a leadership role. I wasn't a manager. That's what I'd applied for. They gave me the feedback. I'd be too autocratic, too risk-taking. I wouldn't be a good leader. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I'm yeah. still trying to prove that I can be a good yeah. leader. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we have another generic question on LinkedIn posted by Yasmin Latif. And she's asking, if one wanted to invest to start a business, which market or markets would you recommend? So I think, again, going back to what I said before, look for something that solves a problem. It could yeah. be any market, any market you yeah. will be successful excellent on on the notes of new markets and new opportunities what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency i think it's one of those that is going to go Poof. okay i Interesting. really do yeah. um and to be fair i'd say i don't really understand it enough to make the comments but what i yeah. see through social media etc i do think you know like we have the the shares everybody was into shares and mm. the dot-com booms and everything yeah. i think that's going to catch up but okay. i actually personally don't understand enough about to make that. a qualified yes. opinion or share a qualified yeah. in your opinion from what you've observed yes. yeah is <laughs> yeah. in your words yes okay Finally, quick fire round. Okay, so the aim is I ask you a question, first thing comes into okay. your head, you answer the question. Okay. Only five questions okay. here. We're not going to make this lengthy. Android or iPhone? iPhone. I thought it might be. Okay. Mac or PC? Mac. Oh, okay. Um, tea or coffee? Tea. Tea. If, and if somebody wrote your biography, what would be a good title? Oh my gosh. If they wrote my biography. Yeah. So it'd have to be, I'm not allowed to swear, so hashtag J-F-D-I. Okay. <laughs> Just F, do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Final question. If you could have dinner with anyone in history, who would it be? Oh, God, if I could have dinner with anybody in history. Oh, um, maybe something like Nelson Mandela. Brilliant. Good choice. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, Kavita, thank you so much for taking some uh, valuable time out of your day to join us, uh, Pathway to Grow, in this interview. Uh, it was more of a conversation. I'm sure the audience will have got a lot of value from this, and I'm sure we'll be wanting to do this again. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Another high five. Thank you. <laughs>